Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, ARF lunch talk. Uh, briefly, next week's uh, talk will be by uh, ARF research associate and UC Berkeley lecturer, Dr. Tim Gill, uh, talking with the concept of meaning in Ice Age arts. And before we start, is there any other announcements anybody has? No? Okay. So today we'll hear from Ted Pena, Professor Emeritus, Department of Ancient Greek and Roman Studies. Is here to talk about his work on the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project. Uh, a little bit about Ted, um, education, BA from Wesleyan University, MA and PhD from the University of Michigan, an interdepartmental program in classical art and archaeology in 1987. Uh, positions, uh, lecturer assistant professor at University of Albany SUNY, departments of anthropology and the classics from 1985 to 1994, assistant professor and associate professor and professor professor right at university of buffalo suny department of classics 1994 2009 professor uc berkeley department of classics ancient greek and roman studies 2009 to 2020 24 emeritus as of 7 uh, 24. Um, field work uh pompeii artifact life history projects and palatine east pottery project and some of Ted interest involved roman uh, italy ceramic analysis material culture and artifact life history um, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming out in the heat. Um, yes, I'll move forward. Uh, do we have the, the lights being down help somewhat? Yeah. Um, thanks, Junko. Uh, until, uh, is that sufficiently visible to folks or would having more lights off? Okay, that's good. Um, is that that better for people? Okay, yeah. Um, really until uh, about 2012, I was uh, a pottery specialist um, and I'm showing you our uh, drying racks from uh, the other project that was just mentioned that I've been involved with for decades, the Palatine's Pottery Project, where we have uh, something like 20 metric tons of Roman pottery that came out of a excavation in, in downtown Rome. And I'll exaggerate a bit, but this is pretty typical of what you find on Roman sites, certainly of the imperial period, certainly urban sites, just massive, massive, massive amounts of uh, typically discarded ceramics and not a great deal more. Uh, you get a little bit of iron, the occasional mm, piece of bronze. There could be some glass, objects in stone, things like that. But however you measure it, so maybe by weight, um, the stone is really heavy. Uh, the, the vast majority of the stuff that you get in a Roman site is pottery. And I kind of had that as my specialization. Uh, when, I, when I moved to Berkeley, um, I uh, was increasingly thinking that um, I should try to do research that would um, allow me to um, get outside that box. Uh, and so I have a couple of fake slides. Um, and um, I became more interested in looking at, at Roman portable material culture more broadly to try to get a more holistic picture of, uh, of in particular, the, the life history of artifacts, how artifacts, in fact, are, are washing through uh, the Roman world and then, then out uh, the other side. Um, so I had this idea that um, I would go to Pompeii because at, at Pompeii, you have opportunities to look at a, a broader array of the portable material culture in the world. So um, once I got behind me making up my obligatory gag asterisk slide, uh, which I show you here, uh, I moved ahead um, and uh, initiated the project I'll be talking about today called the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project or, or PALHIP. Um, and, uh, so a little bit about that. Uh, it's been underway since 2012. We did our uh, final field season, wrapped it up uh, in July of this year. Uh, I'd scheduled it kind of conceived of as, as two five-year uh, research cycles um, and got interrupted for a couple of years by COVID. We couldn't go out in 2020 or 2021. So it put us back a few years. But in the first five-year cycle, uh, we phase one, we uh, looked at a variety of uh, different um, sets of materials that have been excavated in the past at Pompeii, but in contexts that 
promise to um, uh, tell us about uh, aspects of artifact life history, give us some, some interesting evidence for that. Um, and each of these was called the sub-project. And so we began by looking at the artifact assemblage from a completely excavated kind of low-end Roman villa just outside Pompeii called the Villa Regina Bosco Reale. Uh, we then uh, looked at a, uh, a set of materials that had been discarded on the surface of a Roman street uh, next to the very well-known uh, known, uh, uh, house of the, the Castiamanti of the, the chaste lovers. Uh, we then analyzed materials from a uh, large refuse midden that had been dumped uh, just against the outer face of the fortification walls of Pompeii uh, near the Porta di Nola uh, Tower 8. Uh, we looked at a, a large set, uh, set of dolia, these massive storage jars that were in a, uh, what had been an ancient orchard and a property in uh, Block 122 um, at Pompeii. And then lastly, we uh, uh, spent a season uh, outside Pompeii again at the Villa Beato Plantis, uh, a settlement about two kilometers away. Uh, that uh, was a, um, uh, a wine packaging facility looking at some of the amphorae, the, the wine containers there. Um, we then shifted over after a, an off season in 2017 to uh, phase two. Phase two, what we did was we focused all of our attention on uh, uh, looking at the uh, artifact assemblages from a set of properties in one particular block in Pompeii. Uh, Pompeii is a uh, uh, divided into by archaeologists into nine different uh, regions. And each of these regions, each block is given a unique number. And then with the, each block, each doorway is given a unique number. So there's this address system. And uh, we were entirely modern. Uh, we were uh, looking then at, at uh, region one, Insula 11, um, uh, which uh, I chose because it was a, a block that was given over almost entirely to residential structures, uh, which might seem normal to you, but in many parts of Pompeii, including the eastern part of the, of the town where we were, uh, in fact, large areas are given over to things like vineyards and orchards and not to mention all kinds of uh, workshops and economic facilities and things of that sort. And I wanted to look at household assemblages. So 111 was good that way. And it was also good because it consisted primarily of residential structures that we can think of as sort of sitting in about the middle or middle to lower part of the uh, uh, the hierarchy of, uh, of houses as defined by, by size. Uh, so these were modest size houses, which also logically would have been inhabited by folks who weren't at the, the apex of uh, social economic uh, community, but were somewhere in the middle to middle lower part. Um, and uh, we asked certain questions about these artifact assemblages, which I've uh, indicated for you here. Uh, uh, what did... Uh, residential groups, households you prefer, what did they possess, and, and how can we uh, understand that in terms of, for example, um, uh, costliness? Um, how did they acquire, use, curate, and discard these items? Um, how did they dispose of them, not dispose in the sense of throw away, but in the sense of position, place within the structure, right? Um, and uh, then how did uh, these artifacts circulate within the structure and beyond the structure? So these are some of the kinds of questions that we had. Um, here's a, a map of Pompeii with its characteristic football shape. It's not actually fuchsia colored or whatever you're seeing here, um, showing you uh, some of the uh, areas that I'm talking about. I guess even though I can't use my advancer, I guess I have a pointer attached to it, which will be helpful. So let me fish that out. And uh, I can show you some things or point to some things. Um, Do you need to use your pointer? Um, I think I should have one here that, that yeah, here we go. Um, so uh, this is uh, region one block 11 where uh, phase two uh, has focused. Um, uh, going back in time though, uh, with phase one, we started with the Villa Regina, which is about a kilometer and a half off in this direction. Uh, we then uh, worked on the materials from the street surface here uh, we worked on the materials from the extramural midden over here. Uh, we worked on the dolia from the uh, orchard uh, behind a house uh, over here. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we worked with the amphorae from uh, a Plantis Villa B about a kilometer and a half in, in that direction there. So it'll give you some sense about uh, where things were. Um, here's a, a plan uh, of uh, region one 
uh, block 11, Regio 1, Insula 11 uh, in, in Latin. Um, a synopsis of the properties. Uh, there are about eight different residential structures in here, a little bit of economic activity here. It's on the south side of the so-called Gila La Bombanza, the main street in Pompeii. Um, but this was, uh, again, chosen because it was largely residential. Uh, it was uh, consisted of residences, uh, not at the, the large end of the residential structures. Um, uh, it uh, was excavated uh, all at once, if not particularly well. Um, and uh, I have a little note to myself down here. I chose it because it was in theory not of interest to anyone else, so there wouldn't be turf battles, but in fact, it's wound up that there are all these other groups that uh, are trying to get their, have see, gotten their fingers into the uh, 111 pie, uh, a bit to my chagrin. Um, at any rate, uh, I've been uh, working kind of since COVID to come up with the first major synthesis of some of our work. And here is my, uh, my um, table of contents for uh, a, something that started as an article, but now it's 194,000 words long, uh, which I'm just about to ship to Internet Archaeology, which has expressed interest in it. I, I kind of want to go open access online for this kind of thing, right? Um, and what it is, is a comparative study of three of the residences, the Villa Regina farmhouse, and then two of the residences in uh, Block 111, um, uh, from the point of view of the disposition of artifacts. That is, where were people placing things, keeping things? How did things move around inside these structures and then beyond these structures? So uh, I think I kind of finished this last week, but I'm been working on it so long, a little nervous about sending it off. So I think I'm going to let it sit for a couple of days and maybe over the weekend, try to clean it up a little bit. But um, it's pretty much ready to go. Now, um, I want to not forget to uh, spend a couple of minutes on acknowledgments. And uh, one acknowledgement that I absolutely have to make is that uh, all of our field seasons have received uh, support uh, from the ARF's stall fund, uh, which has been instrumental in allowing us to to do this work. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the project is I wanted to be small, uh, cheap, and low impact, right? So we're only working with things already excavated, no new excavation. Uh, we never have more people in one season that can fit inside a compact sedan, so four or five, because we have to drive around. Um, and uh, the budget is very, very low. And so uh, Stahl's contribution uh, has represented a, a very large portion of the funding that's allowed us to do this. And I want to acknowledge just how great it's been to have that source of funding uh, available uh, to the project. I also, of course, have to acknowledge the, uh, the uh, branch of the Italian Antiquity Service, which has authorized and supported the work. This is the Parco Archeologico di Pompeii, the Archaeological Park of Pompeii. If I stopped and recognized all of the individual functionaries in the PAP uh, that have uh, facilitated the work, that would take the rest of my hours. So I'll just take a wave at that and acknowledge that, of course, without their their authorization and coordination and support, none of this would have happened. And I also want to uh, thank the, the uh, uh, members of the team who have uh, participated in this. They're, uh, by and large, uh, Berkeley uh, graduate students in different departments. I think I've managed to capture all of them in these four season uh, slides. This is from our first season, 2012, we're on top of Vesuvius. Uh, here's Caroline Chung, who's finished her PhD in AHMA. Uh, Elizabeth Niespolo, who was an undergraduate in classics and planetary sciences, uh, and then went on to do a PhD here at Berkeley uh, in, um, in uh, uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences. Um, both Caroline and Elizabeth, this is amazing, are assistant professors at Princeton University, as we speak, Caroline in classics and uh, Elizabeth in geosciences. Um, we move a little bit later. This is about 2016 here on top of our apartment house. Here's Vesuvius in the background. Uh, Caroline's still here. We have La Marest, who completed a PhD in history of art here. Uh, La is now the uh, associate curator of coins at the Harvard Art Museum. Uh, Gina Tibbet, who at that time was a grad student in anthropology at Temple. Uh, Gina has uh, uh, gone on to different things and is now earning her living as a potter. Uh, and Aaron Brown, uh, who completed his PhD in, uh, in uh, classical archaeology uh, here at Berkeley a couple of years ago, and Aaron is now a lecturer at uh, Stanford. Um, if we move a little bit later, this is about 2018. Uh, this is Sarah Erickson, who is uh, currently a graduate student in the Department of Anthropology here at UC Berkeley, and I think is a pre-doc fellow at the Institute for 
slavery independent studies and things like that in Bonn. Um, and uh, this is Susanna Fosbush, uh, who is even as we speak in Pompeii working on her dissertation. Uh, uh, and uh, here's Aaron again. Here's Ryan Reynolds, not that Ryan Reynolds, uh, who's uh, completing his PhD also here in classical archaeology. Uh, and then lastly, this is 2022. We're all very happy to have survived COVID. Uh, this is Santa Fastbush again, and this is uh, Cesca Lapasta, who is uh, also in classical archaeology and is just beginning a dissertation, which will involve a lot of field work at, at Pompeii as well. Um, so um, uh, that's our crew, uh, nearly all then uh, graduate students from UC Berkeley. Um, now, uh, I put this slide up. These are, are not graduate students from UC Berkeley. Uh, but uh, those on the project feel like this a lot. And I'm gonna get to this and maybe I'll communicate some of this excitement we feel because what we're doing is uh, great for people who are not into any delayment playing of gratification because what we're doing is we're going directly to the storms and bringing out these spectacular, amazing objects, the sort that like you would never see otherwise. And so in recent years in particular, we've been working at the storage uh, uh, facility inside Pompeii at the Casa di Bacco it's kind of like it's Christmas three or four times a day because we're allowed to get out five or six artifacts at a time from the storeroom. Uh, we give the, uh, the, uh, uh, the catalog card, the so-called uh, uh, skate buffetti, here you go, uh, to the uh, functionary called the consegnatario, the person who gives and gives over uh, the objects. Um, he or she will disappear back into the storerooms and come out with a cassette to one of the interlocking standard plastic artifact trays. Uh, with these objects in it. And even on the basis of the skate of Buffetti, we have some idea of what this object is supposed to be. This one tells us we have a punto rollo and also, which would be like an awl and bone or something like that. Um, what comes out of the storms is often like unexpected and amazing. And so like I say, it's kind of like getting Christmas three or four times a day, five days a week. And so uh, that's why I put up that slide of all those uh, thrilled students. And so what I'm going to do in, in this talk, the rest of this talk, is I'm going to uh, just trot out a bunch of interesting artifacts. In the last few years, thinking back, back in February, I talked about uh, working with the documentation uh, back into the 1960s. Before that, I, I looked at some of the ways that we're trying to look at the disposition of artifacts inside structures. In an earlier lecture, I looked at how we're trying to um, characterize uh, household assemblages. Uh, and then in earlier lectures, going all the way back to phase one of the project that talked about some of our results. So what I want to do today is just like, it's kind of like artifact porn. It's kind of, you know, quick and, and dirty, just trotting out all this cool stuff and showing you some of the things that we've been lucky enough to be able to uh, have access to and to include in our research. I start with this image, which is five objects from the Villa Regina Boscoreale, just to make a certain point. And that is that, you know, typically artifact assemblages are going to be objects in, uh, in terracotta, right? Here we see a pod, here we see a terracotta oil lamp. You might get a little bit of things in stone. This is a, a, a hone over here. Um, but what you almost never find, because these things uh, were recycled intensely and or, uh, in the case of metals, decomposed, are artifacts in bronze and artifacts in glass, right? And so typically in the Roman world, these things would have been plucked out of the waste stream and recycled. And so uh, even though we can see that they were you know, quite common in assemblages of artifacts, uh, that um, they're pretty rare to find in the archaeological record. And so um, at a place like Pompeii, we have the opportunity to really study these sorts of things. Um, I was talking about how the project is low impact and low tech and low cost or, or low, low, uh, low cost. It's also uh, perforce low tech. A lot of this just involves uh, looking at objects with certain questions in mind and measuring them with certain questions in mind. Uh, we haven't had budget or, or time or really the wiggle room because of the difficulty in getting things out of the storerooms to engage in a great deal of um, more sophisticated uh, investigations. Uh, to here see our team in about eh, 2016 or so uh, looking at stuff. Uh, including La, who was our photographer. This is probably a day when we forgot to bring the espresso or something like that. <laughs> I suspect she's sleeping under there rather than photographing. Uh, but um, so uh, that's largely what we do. Now, I want to start by uh, talking about uh, kind of perversely in a sense pottery, because the point I want to make is that um, even though pottery is ho-hum, right? It's like 99% of our artifacts in Roman archaeology. Um, 
the pottery we have at Pompeii is not necessarily that, but it also is spectacular in certain ways. And, and I, uh, even though I was already a ceramic specialist, have like seen a lot of new and different things and learned a lot from our work with pottery in the project. So here I'm showing you a, a typical uh, Ola, that's Latin for cook pot, that's why it's Oya in Spanish, right? Um, and you can see it's got the typical um, uh, carbon deposition on it because carbon resides in the tips of flames, right? And you know, from any Roman site, you've got your cookwares and they're all sooted like this, that's completely normal. Um, but here's the thing flipped over. Uh, and what we have here, I've never seen anywhere else, and that is on the underside and on the lower walls, what you have is this powdery light gray substance. And what that is, is that's, um, that's ash that adhered to it, right? Uh, because I'm sure as uh, I, I see one Italian out in the audience, so she will uh, attest to us that when you're cooking with an ola or what in Italian would be a piñata, um, you, you nestle it into the embers kind of from the side. They often have a handle just on one side, which you'll be pointing out, right? Um, and so uh, this is really good evidence that that was the way that this particular form is also being used for cooking uh, at, at Pompeii. So something like this, or if we go to this particular form, which, um, of which over like nearly 800 exist in the storeroom at Pompeii, uh, that's like one for every... 10 people who might have lived in the town is in captivity. So what I think it probably was, was kind of like the personal, uh, you know, the personal um, water bottle or wine bottle or whatever of, of your average Pompeian. Um, and uh, so they're quite abundant, but as I'm trying to indicate to you here, it's not popping particularly well. And a couple of these we've looked at, there's this very distinct uh, drip of stain discoloration running down from the base of the neck to the shoulder of the vessel. Um, and it's, you know, pretty much opposite you see where you would have been pouring from uh, at about the six, seven o'clock position if you put the handle at 12. And so uh, this appears to be organic residue from what was the content of this vessel that got deposited on the shoulder when it was being used um, that has survived through to the present. Um, and so uh, we see uh, use alterations of this sort. Um, I mentioned that one of our sub-projects in phase one was looking at Amphry from the uh, Aplantis Villa B wine packaging facility. Uh, and we principally looked at what's your standard local package for wine uh, in Tyrrhenian, Italy, the Dressel 2.4 Amphra. Uh, here you see Law Mares uh, using an iPad with a, 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 a 3D scanner attachment to uh, take a scan of the thing. We've perched it on what this is. It's one of my I think my best ever invention, it's a, it's a swimming pool noodle folded in the shape of a U. Uh, and it's great for keeping Amphry from rolling off tables and falling onto the, onto the ground. We call it an ass, an Amphry support system. Anyway, uh, Law is here uh, uh, scanning into this. Uh, and here you see the kinds of results that, uh, that we can come up with. And we've kind of managed to learn a lot about the Dressel 2.4 container from our close looking at it. Um, in particular, uh, what we can see is that uh, they tend to be uh, uh, one Roman foot in maximum diameter. Uh, they tend to be three Roman feet high. Uh, and uh, the uh, port from the, uh, uh, from the ledge at the top of the wall where the shoulder begins to the rim is, is one of those three feet. So it's pretty clear that when they were forming these amphorae, they were, you know, they, they weren't making them with, you know, lasers and things like that. But the potters, you know, probably had, uh, calipers and, and things like that, that they were using to roughly uh, make them to a particular size, which would have been really useful, not only for the capacity, but also for storing these and lading them on ships and things like that, right? If you have a standardized uh, shape you're working with, it makes things a bit easier. Um, and uh, we know that uh, these uh, tended to have a capacity which oscillated around, but was very close to what in the Roman world was one cubic foot uh, the Romans uh, count inclusively, so a cubic foot is called a, a quadrantal. Um, and that was also a unit of measure that confusingly for us, the Romans called an amphora. So an amphora is a unit of measure as well as a container, right? So this tended to be a, a one amphora amphora, and that would translate into our terms in 26.2 liters. And you, were, you can work out, you know, what would have been the capacity of a, 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 a three foot uh, by one foot cylinder and, and you know, uh, what percentage of that capacity a Dressel 2.4 would have held and think about it as a form of efficiency and, and things of that sort. Um, another thing that we saw, which was 
completely amazing to me, it's one of the coolest things I've seen in archaeology, is that um, it seems pretty clear that in many cases they were uh, decanting wine from the amphorae, not by pulling the plug that would have been driven into the mouth, but they were drilling a hole in the wall, sometimes quite low down, uh, sometimes two holes, the kind of way, you know, if you're trying to get uh, juice out of a can of fruit juice, you have to open two holes in the top so air can come in one and the juice can come out the other, right? Um, and they were uh, uh, probably putting them up in horizontal racks and decanting wine out of them that way. And then amazingly, they were taking pot sherds and they were rounding them off into little discs and they were jamming them back in the hole. And you can see some residual. They are covering what seems to be raw clay. Um, so the intention seems to have been to patch this so that they could use it again. Um, and to me, that's astonishing because I would not think that would be a very robust way of resealing your amphora. But uh, a plantus B is full of uh, used Roman amphorae that were going to be reconditioned to be reused. Um, uh, what you're looking at here is, is another remarkable thing. You're looking uh, at a, a neck of an amphora broken off and looking up from the underside. And this thing you see here is not some kind of you know, volleyball that got exposed to Vesuvius eruption, but it was a cork disc that was driven in here as the stopper. Um, and uh, the empty amphora, which was probably emptied by having tap holes drilled in it, was thrown onto a stack of other amphorae upside down so that the spike of the one on the lower level jammed up into the mouth of this one, and it pushed the, the cork into this kind of almost semicircular shape where it, it then uh, did get uh, uh, kind of flash fried by Vesuvius's eruption. Uh, and so this is an amphora that was used, but never uncorked. Uh, and so uh, the B uh, provides amazing evidence. Uh, a uh, recent PhD at University of Texas, Jennifer Muslin, uh, did a dissertation on these things. And it's, it's quite amazing stuff. Um, Elsewhere at Pompeii and the trash midden, uh, which had been studied by other scholars who shall remain nameless, uh, we uh, pretty quickly realized that they contained a certain amount of pottery that pretty clearly were wasters. Uh, that is pottery with manufacturing defects. Uh, here you see some of those that have been overfired and reduced. Um, and so we were able to identify, if only at arm's length, the presence of a, of a pottery workshop at Pompeii and the sorts of, uh, of items that it was manufacturing. Uh, so that's been one of the things we've been able to discover. Um, now, uh, I want to move on and uh, talk about all these other categories of artifacts, though, that uh, I dangle in front of you. And next, I want to talk about glass. Uh, and I've actually uh, spent the last couple of years learning uh, a lot about glass. I'm by no means a glass specialist, but I'm far more knowledgeable than I once was. And so uh, what you see here is you're looking down on the, the, the disc of a, uh, of a Roman oil lamp, right? And these typically have scenes in relief. And what you see here is a relief not of someone drinking through a very long straw, but of, of someone blowing glass in a glass workshop. This is a, a classic piece of evidence we have for trying to understand uh, Roman uh, uh, glass technology. Now, um, glass blowing uh, along with uh, concrete are widely regarded as the two great technological innovations of, of the Roman world. Um, and it looks as though glass blowing was first kind of figured out uh, sometime in the middle of the first century BC in Syro Palestine. Our earliest dated evidence for something that seems like a very lame approach to blowing glass go, is from Jerusalem actually and dates to the, the 40s BC. And it's super interesting because uh, it's real clear now, well, not as clear as it might be, but clear enough that um, the uh, the discovery of glass blowing and then the innovation of the technologies you need and the diffusion and adoption of these took a few generations to happen. Uh, there, that is, there had to be a constellation of certain technological approaches that came together before glass blowing kind of uh, crystallized and took off. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting case about uh, kind of technological innovation. And Pompeii is positioned very nicely to kind of give us some insights into, into uh, those processes. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, so here is all the vessel glass that came out of the midden that was uh, dumped over the wall uh, at the Porta di Nola. Um, and it's really interesting because the bulk of the glass is pretty clearly uh, glass that is not formed by blowing, but by other techniques about which I'll say a bit in a slide or two down the road. Um, but there are a few examples. This here is a neck of an unguentarium, a, a perfume bottle, something like that. Here's a base of one of those. Here's another base down here. Um, but these are, are very heavy and kind of, how shall I say, 
um, unsophisticated efforts to blow glass. And uh, looking at the pottery from these deposits, nothing needs to date any later than about 25 AD, AD 25, maybe as late as AD 50. So it looks like deposition here ended, in, let's say, in the second quarter of the first century uh, AD. Um, and so we can see like a little bit of, uh, of early blown glass here, right? Uh, but it's, uh, again, uh, again, not particularly sophisticated and, and, um, and, and not very abundant. Um, if you look at the glass from the, the set of uh, uh, discarded items we looked at off a street surface, um, this is also interesting in, in terms of kind of, you know, the evolution of, of uh, glass making in the Roman world. Um, that we went through maybe about seven or eight uh, crates of material, and this was all of the glass that we found to where, in fact, I went back to the person who had excavated it and gave us permission to look at it and said, so did, did a glass specialist come along and take out all the glass to study this? And she said, no, no, this is everything that came off the road. Um, and um, uh, if I compared this to the amount of pretty much any other, even iron and bronze are far, far more abundant than this. So there was almost no glass making its way into the waste stream and only very small pieces. You can see the scale down here. And this is because already by probably this, it's mainly material deposited, and I would guess in the last decade or so of the town's life, that glass was being intensively recycled. Um, that uh, raw glass was only produced in, in two places, in a couple of spots in, in Egypt and in some places in Syro Palestine. Um, and so uh, once glass vessels became widely diffused, people also began recycling them pretty intensively so that glass makers wouldn't depend upon uh, raw glass from those sources, but they could use. Uh, recycled glass. And so uh, this is pretty clearly evidence that uh, there's pretty intensive glass recycling going on. So um, here is the, uh, a vessel that came out of an AD 79 context as part of a set of, I think, five very similar vessels. They're in this semi-opaque uh, uh, emerald green glass. Uh, and these are vessels that were probably kind of old style when uh, Vesuvius erupted because these are made not by blowing, they're made by a technique called sagging, uh, which is how in the Hellenistic world in the uh, Roman Republic, you made glass vessels. And what that consists of, and here's a couple of, uh, of uh, figures that'll kind of help you imagine that, is you, you make a, uh, a, a disc of, uh, of sort of semi-molten of, of uh, malleable glass paste, and then you, some fashion, drape it over the outside of a mold. In this case, the kind of mold would be called a jigger, right? And then you can finish it in various ways. This is making one of these uh, classic ribbed Hellenistic bowls. Here, the, they're suggesting you stamped it and then you draped it. Um, but this is the way that before glass blowing uh, was developed and diffused, that you could make uh, open glass vessels. And this is, you know, at least a quite beautiful objects and uh, quite useful ones, but. Um, you know, kind of the, the rate of production was probably relatively modest and um, nothing like what you get once uh, blowing diffuses. So uh, here in contrast, uh, these people's neighbors uh, had uh, uh, three vessels that nested one inside the other, a very nice set. And here's one of them uh, in blown glass. Uh, this piece, which is about this big, only weighs, I think, like 54 grams. And it's really amazing. It's almost weightless. It's transparent. It's thin. Uh, it's, it's an astonishing thing that must have made a big impact on people when something like this became available. And those of you, there are historical archaeologists out here for, you're looking out here, you're looking, you're saying, oh, and it also has a ponty mark right here in the middle of the floor, uh, on the underside is like a little ridge, right? And that tells you how this kind of vessel, uh, was formed, uh, by the technique called ponting, uh, because when you are blowing glass, right? You, you get a wad on the blowpipe, you blow it into a paraise and a bubble. Um, and that's nice, but then you have to kind of get that off the blowpipe um, and then uh, take it back to the fire mount to heat it up so you can work the opening where it was attached to the blowpipe and make a rim or open it up or whatever it is. So you have to find some other way of grabbing this like really, really hot pipe vessel in some way uh, so you can detach it from the blowpipe. Uh, and early on, they must have used some kind of tool, which you call like a snap paste tool, some kind of a, uh, a grabber that you could use to hold things. Uh, there's evidence for using that, like in the 17th century, making wine bottles and stuff like that. But eventually people figure out you can take a solid 
steel rod that's called a, a, a ponty or a punty spelled uh, P-O-N-T-I-L, right? Or P-U-N-T-Y sometimes. And you can uh, attach it, uh, put a little glass in, you can attach it to the end of the vessel. You can then detach the vessel from the blowpipe. Uh, here you see it's being done with shears up here. Uh, they're doing it, I think, with, uh, with, with jacks, which are the big tongs, the big all-purpose tongs that, that glass makers use. And so uh, it seems pretty clear that this technique of ponting, which really liberates glass blowers to begin to make large open vessels uh, in ways they couldn't just using a snap case tool, you think about it, it has to grab it right around it, um, comes in last, well, let's say in the third quarter of the first century AD, 50 to AD 75, let's say. So just in the final years of life of count, in, the, in the life of the town of Pompeii. And so a vessel like this was probably something of, a, of, a, of an impressive novelty, right? And it's a strong contrast with that other glass vessel we were just looking at, right? Uh, so we can see things like that. Um, we also have evidence, of course, for uh, blowing into molds. Uh, here's a small uh, perfume bottle in the shape of a fig uh, that was blown into a two-piece mold. Uh, you can see the seam uh, on the side of it there. Um, you had to break off the neck probably to get at the contents. There's a little bit of contents preserved inside. So we also get a lot of evidence. This is probably actually produced in Syria, it's thought. So it's good evidence for the importing of some kind of, uh, you know, literally exotic sort of unguent or perfume or something like that from the eastern provinces of the empire. Um, we also get evidence for uh, um, the reworking of glass. So here's a, a glass flask, which has had its uh, rim and uh, neck broken off, uh, and, and upper neck broken off. Here's a detail of it. And uh, it clearly was done uh, by this technique, which glass makers call cracking off, uh, because glass is an amorphous silicate. Once a crack starts propagating, it'll just run. So if you take a, a glass bottle and etch a horizontal line in the neck and then expose it to heat, the crack, crack will propagate right around and almost in a perfect circle. Typically, there's a little bit of offset at the end of it, like you're seeing right here. And it turns out that cracking off is one of these things. There's like, like endless YouTube videos of hobbyists who like think it's fun to crack off wine bottles and make their own flower pots and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, we can uh, see some evidence for this sort of modification. Probably this thing broke on its neck and they cracked off the rest to sort of make it more useful. Um, I want to move on and, and look a little bit at uh, bronze uh, following up on glass. Uh, and so here you see this quite, uh, quite spectacular uh, bronze bucket, but to sound learned, we can call it a situla, which is just Latin for a bucket. Um, and uh, uh, there was one of these in each of the three residences that I've studied. So it seems like it was like a, a, an essential thing for basically getting water up out of a cistern, right? You'd lower this thing down a cistern. And what you're seeing here is that the, the body of it is in sheet bronze, which is produced by the technique of raising. You go out to eat, let's say, at a, at a, um, a Thai restaurant or an Indian restaurant, say so you might get these little bronze cups you drink from. Those are made by raising. You basically start with a disc and you use an anvil and you hammer the hell out of it. And if you know what you're doing, you can turn it into a, a, a full vessel. Um, you see a couple of, of views of, of people involved in, uh, in raising. And so you can create this bucket with this, you add the, the base separately. But you can see here, it has another element, uh, which is in, uh, what looks like leopard skin, but it's actually iron. Uh, and this is a stiffening ring uh, with a basket handle, right? Um, and so this is interesting because it, it begins to make us think about uh, something that's kind of a, a big deal in craft studies now, which is, which is cross-craft cross interaction. You know, it's not that potters and glass blowers or smiths or whatever work in a complete vacuum, but there's some interplay between people in these different crafts, right? And so to make this artifact, it would have required the participation not only of someone who uh, was a bronze worker, but also someone who was an ironsmith, right, uh, to make this stiffening ring and basket handle. How did this work? Did ironsmiths just turn these things out in series, kind of with no connection to a particular order they got, or would they wait till they got an order? Uh, would uh, the, uh, I assume that the bronze worker had to get the stiffening ring before, uh, before they uh, decided how they were going to go about making their thing, right? But it raises sort of interesting issues about how craft production was organized. Now, if we zoom in on this, we see some amazing stuff. You see this kind of weird blue copper sulfate uh, oxidation product. Um, but you see they've taken the rim and they've bent it, making a little break right here, probably modifying the way it came from the Smith, uh, so that 
uh, they can pour water out of it easily, or I suspect also so that when you lower it down a well and hits the bottom, it'll tip and water will fill in through this, right? But you have to have, be able to lower it down and have it tip. Um, so you can see a, a lot of kind of modifications. And this reminds us that, that sheet bronze is, is great because it's, it's really susceptible to damage and to use alterations, right? Unlike pottery or glass, it just kind of break, right? Uh, and so bronze vessels kind of uh, have layered into them often this rich history, which helps us see how they were made and, and how they were used. Um, uh, the reason that this iron rim looks the way it does is because the volcanic lapilli that buried this got welded onto the rim as it oxidized, right? So the conservators like took off the big parts of them, but they couldn't take off the connection you see between what's left of the iron uh, and, uh, and the lapilli. That's why it has that bizarre leopard skin appearance. Um, now, um, this is very cool um, because if you look even casually at the oxidation product on the rim, what you can see is the cast of cord that was wrapped around the rim, right? So that this could be lowered down uh, into a well. Uh, and so uh, we have to imagine, you see, that this bucket was outfit something like that. Um, if you pursue this a little further uh, and you go below the... Uh, the maximum diameter on the uh, wall, and you look just at that diameter just below it, you can see there's a swarm of dents right here. Uh, and that's from where we can imagine someone's dropping it down a well and it's banging into the stones along the side, right? We actually have the well in which this was probably lowered. Um, and uh, my favorite thing, which is like, I have to admit, it's a big fantasy on my part. I was thinking about this and I got curious and said, well, what does the bottom of this look like? So I imagine myself pulling a big bucket of water up a well and being tired and like, when I get it up to the top, just thumping it down on the edge of the well to rest for a moment, right? Um, and the handles are here at about seven o'clock and two o'clock. If you look at the base, you can see a very distinct crease running along right here. Um, and I admit it's a pretty, pretty uh, a fantastic thing, uh, but I would have made a crease like this for sure. Uh, and it's exactly where you expect it to be if you, if you raise it up that way and, and dropped it on, on the edge of the well when you brought it up. Um, now, uh, in addition to uh, bronze vessels, we have all kinds of bronze implements that we find. Uh, some are quite simple, little ear scoops and stuff like that. I'll show you with stylus if we can get to it today. Um, but we also have these very complex things that are really represent kind of high technology at that time that were made by you know, very, very uh, skilled craftsmen. What we're looking at here is what's called a steel yard, right? It's a type of balance instead of kind of having a fulcrum in the middle and let's say two pans. It has a fulcrum set off to one side uh, to give mechanical advantage, right? So you have a load arm where you have a couple of hooks where you could uh, hang something you wanted to weigh. Uh, you then have an effort arm over here where you have a movable weight that you could slide along uh, and, and figure out the weight, right? This one actually happens to have a double fulcrum because it has a fulcrum and a hook on this side. And then you also see another one on the bottom and that's because it was reversible. Um, uh, if you hang, hung it one way, uh, and I'll show you this in a minute. We know because it's, it's labeled for us. Uh, you could weigh things in increments of half a Roman pound, a Roman pound is about 328 grams, uh, from half a pound to nine pounds. Then if you flipped it over and hung it from the other fulcrum, you can see in the scale, you could weigh things from 10 pounds to 32 pounds. Uh, and so uh, this was a multiple uh, purpose scale. Um, the weight is in the shape of an acorn. Uh, I'm not certain ideologically, I mean, acorn is like a nice shape to have, but it probably did mean something. It was balanophagy in the Roman world, I suppose. Um, weighs 628 grams, which is not the equivalent of any particular unit in the Roman uh, system of, of weights. Uh, but that doesn't matter because what matters is the ratio of the distance between the fulcrum and the end of the effort arm and, and where something, or end of the load arm and where something is placed on the effort arm, right? Uh, and so uh, if we then zoom in and look at the, the scale, this is what I was talking about, you can see there are notches where you could uh, nest uh, the wire that the weight is hanging from. And these are labeled five, six, seven, eight, and you have uh, halfway marks in between, right? So this shows us uh, how the whole thing was, was labeled to be used. So this is a really sophisticated, you know, carefully made and amazingly well-preserved, I might add. You can still use this today. We didn't try to see if it really weighs accurate. We didn't have the time or permission. Uh, but it's an amazing thing. Um, other sorts of bronze objects that we find uh, might be uh, things like this um, seal ring, 
uh, which uh, has a name in reverse of L. Uh, Kaili Januaria, Lucius Kaelius Januarius, or belonging to, to him. Uh, we find these in some of the houses. Uh, they may well identify a person who lived in that house, maybe even the head of the family or something like that. And that gives us a little grist for our mill to try and to sort of come up with some uh, sociological analysis of things. Um, we find uh, things like this stylus. This is a simple uh, implement. Uh, one of the ways Romans liked to write was uh, incising in wax insets in a wooden tablet, right? And so you can incise with one end of the stylus and flip it around and erase with the other end, right? Uh, and we have some of these wooden tablets from Pompeii, although not in, in our project. Um, and another important form of writing was writing with ink. Uh, we have a large number of, of ink wells. We have uh, three from one house to where I suspect the person who lived there had some kind of occupation which involved the, the frequent or intensive uh, use of writing, uh, where you have a little stopper which goes in the top, which is hinged and has a little sliding catch. There's a little knob and you slide to one side, which would uh, slide out a little catch and allow you to pop it open so that you could uh, uh, dip your pen in there. Um, and uh, several of the ink wells that we found preserve on the inside uh, residue of, of ink. Uh, this has been analyzed in the past by another group, and what they've uh, established is that uh, uh, ink at Pompeii and more widely in the Roman world is not the sort of iron gall ink that becomes common, let's say, in the Middle Ages and through the modern period, but it's carbon-based ink. Uh, and so we know a lot about that. Um, and uh, kind of to round things out, in our trash dump over the wall, we found these objects, which at first they didn't understand, like in 2014. And then I had this light bulb go off in my head more recently. And um, uh, I realized what these are. These are the tips of ink pens. Uh, most pens in the Roman world would have been made from a reed where you take a, a pen knife and you cut the reed off and you can keep sharpening it, cutting it. But there also were uh, 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 bronze pens, kind of like the pens that architects used to use for, for drawing back in the 19th century. So the ink, uh, this tip has been bent, by the way. So people have been puzzling. This would have been straight. Uh, these have had basically the hell beat out of them or thrown away in a trash dump, right? Uh, and so uh, Cheska and I went back and looked at these these past summer because I was pretty sure I knew what they were, uh, which I didn't know 10 years ago. And uh, so we have evidence uh, for that. Um, elsewhere in the trash dump, we have evidence for... Uh, uh, coinage uh, have a low denomination bronze coins that are so worn that they were useless and thrown away. On the uh, other side of the coin, we have the top of a Roman uh, piggy bank with a slot in it. So they were throwing some coins away, but then they were interested in, in saving others. Uh, and again, uh, the Italian in the audience will readily recognize this form because it's amazingly still the form of a, a Salva Danaio, a piggy bank today in Italy. Here's a bar in Nemi, close to where indeed this person has a house. Uh, uh, it's a tip jar now in a bar, uh, but this is the same form we had for coin banks in, in the Roman world. Um, so uh, let me just go on and I'll, I'll finish up. Uh, I have way more in the can than I can you know, get to, but I'll finish up with a mystery object. We have some objects, we just don't know what they were, right? And so here's this weird thing, which people would describe as, well, object with, with two rings and three pyramids. And that's not bad. It kind of has this plate with rings sticking out perpendicularly or parallel to either side. And then on the underside, it has kind of like these two triangular objects on one side and a big triangular object on the other side. Here you see a side view of it. And people just like don't know what the heck this thing was. Uh, people have been speculating since like the early 19th century. There is a big consensus in the 19th century that maybe they were used by archers for drawing an arrow or something like that. Because I got to tell you that when you look at this kind of look at this thing, it's really not. It's really hard to not do what we're doing uh, right here, uh, which is stick your fingers through those those uh, those two holes. Um, I, for a while, was convinced, for example, that it, it might have been a um, something for processing vegetal matter, for like stripping flax to make get linen or something like that. But I, I don't think that's true anymore. Um, the, the the best recent guess is that it's what in French we call the ciguet. It's a type of item that was part of a harness that would be inserted in a horse's uh, nose and mouth and then be attached to the bridle. Um, so that's kind of the, the standing interpretation, but I don't know if I entirely buy that. I've been walking around for years being bugged by what the heck this thing is. Uh, and once I Googled object with two rings and uh, something like that, and, uh, and Temu showed me a, a something for tying a balloon. Uh, now I'm not going to suggest that Romans had balloons, but it's the kind of thing that, that haunts me and that I think about. Um, anyway, 
uh, I think we're probably uh, to the end of the hour, even though I have way more I could regale you with. So I'll break off here. Maybe I can give a talk later on a cool wooden fan handles and furniture with still intact hinges and locks and things like that. Uh, but maybe for another time. Okay. Uh, I see we're around to the hour, so I'll stop. And I'm happy to, if people need to go, take off. But I'm happy to also to answer any any questions that people might have about any of this or the things I didn't talk about, uh, like the thing you see on the board right now. Yeah, John. Last thing you're showing us, not the balloon tire. Uh, that one. First off, thank you. What a talk. I mean. Now I truly appreciate my colleague Juliet working with me, having been to Pompeii. And now we get his bone crumbs. Look what she ate. Look what she left. But um, this thing is there any kind of um, where in the at the at the central base facet of those three pyramids that you can discern? Um, I don't think the surface is well enough preserved that you that uh, that we've noted any. Mm -hmm. I guess I would say. But right. I, I should say by the way, if anyone has ideas, as as Jun is about to drop on us. I'd be like delighted to have because I, this thing has been bugging me for several years. It now. reminds me of what they use in South Africa to drive needles through thick hide, right? So you place the base of that heavy needle inside there, uh -huh. you push it through the hide, oh, come back around on the other side. So I see what you're saying because it's got the slot on the other side. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I would. I don't know. That's, that's what I mean. Like if it's pitted or something from the back end of a needle. You can see the butt of a needle. You then be able to see it. Some the, kind of uh, of gouge or something facet, on yeah. the on the the one big base. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But they but their folks like leather workers and stuff are making out of like ivory or bone things that mm -hmm. are like mm -hmm. cortical bone, like hardcore stuff that can really support the the needle, but not have it slip and put a hole in your palm. We we photographed the heck out of these, so we may well have a photograph of that surface. Mm -hmm. My guess is, is that one of the difficulties of the, our metal objects, of course, is the surface is generally not well enough preserved that, sure, that those sure. kind use alterations of that sort sure. are going to be observable. But the other thing that, that I would point out, which is, I think, very weird, and you can see it a bit here, um, that on one side of this, there are these, uh, yeah, you can see them there. It almost looks like the nose pieces on a pair of glasses. You know, like they see those two little things and they have some ridges on them, which you could see in the photograph of the hand. Mm -hmm. And so you think like, like, did someone like put this on their head and like put the points out presumably? <laughs> and uh, because those are there for a reason. They're not on the other side. Right. And they have little they have little lines across them, which suggests they're you can see them here a little bit. See that uh, to kind of keep them from slipping, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. And so. Clearly, the object is designed for those things to be resting on something, I think, mm -hmm. right? So you have to imagine some shape that that's on top of. But, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the need, I, I would say like the needle thing, I'll think about that because mm -hmm. I, I, the, the array of those three pointed elements is, you know, it's very deliberate and it can't, it's not for no reason. You know? right. And the look. idea that there's the two little ones on one side and the big one on the other, which is really, I think, what you're getting at to me is yeah. is like that maybe is the solution so way. that that was my nonsense yeah no thank comment. you That's i'm good. sorry i have a i have a real comment go ahead which is when you went through the drip lines on the pitcher being used to dispense liquid or when you had a pot that was being used for cooking and being nestled into the embers potentially at the end of the process of cooking you have all these evocative moments captured in producing serving coming back through you know the repetition of these things i'm curious if you thought through kind of what it might look like in a kitchen to table setting context where these all this all this abatus is like reflected by the 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 the, the reciprocal or not reciprocal the cyclical nature of these actions and and I'm just it's so evocative that you have all of these little bits and pieces of people making and serving and doing with the food. I wonder if you put that together into a sequence of of preparing dinner or well and, and thinking about how objects, for example, were transferred within structures, for example, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm not being as kind of imaginative as you are, that um yeah, you have to imagine that that 
something like an ola is used to, to cook food in, in a, a, a kulina, a kitchen. Uh, we have these cooking platforms. It's pretty clear where they were cooking. And what's cooked inside, it could have been transferred immediately to a serving vessel, but I strongly suspect that the cooking vessel is actually transferred from there to the space where dining occurred, mm. which is a, a different space. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then afterwards, it has to be... Um, probably transferred to some place where it's cleaned. And here, I don't want to go all anachronizing on you. There's only one textual reference at source I know about doing the dishes in the Roman world. <laughs> but they must have had to do the dishes in some way, you know, with a handful of leaves or some sand or whatever it was. Um, and that's got to take place in some place where you have like a water source and a drain or something. And one of the interesting things about Roman houses in general, but Pompeii in particular, is that there was this I'll call it a nucleated approach to storage. We tend to distribute objects out into spaces that are functionally related to them, right? You know, toothbrush in the bathroom and clothes in the bedroom or whatever it is. Um, uh, Romans often had like a centralized place where storage happened. And so you uh, often don't find much in the way of things related to cooking in kitchens. Hmm. Um, and but they're going to be in these storage spaces. So yeah, I've thought quite a bit and see this article that I'm about to ship or this whatever it is, this monograph um, uh, is trying, trying to think about how things circulated around the insides of houses. Maybe not quite in maybe the micro way I think that you're getting at, okay. but in a in a in a more crude way I guess. No, it's not crude at all. It's just it's just we're looking at different scales, yeah. temporal and spatial scales. And I'm thinking yeah. more on the personal level, the experience of the meal. Because when I cook beans in a micaceous pot at home, mm -hmm. the pot itself goes to the side and then people are being served portions from the pot for the rest of the meal, yeah. but the pot never leaves the kitchen. I've tried to think about that in terms of how things are disposed. And I, I, I have, I can think of things that are in use. Let's imagine a pot mm. um, and things that have been placed in storage in some other place. Um, but I also think about kitchens. You have things that I call use ready that you put them off to the side because you know, you're going to want to grab it or whatever it is. Now it's really hard archeologically to kind of, follow through on that because you know it's not a time machine uh, and uh but i've tried to think about how in, in in general terms how people are are positioning objects in terms of when they're using them and when they're going to reuse them and things like that yeah yeah yes junko I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I used to work on pottery and I still do in my lab. So there are a lot of um, things in common you mm -hmm. know, um, <clears throat> between what you're doing and uh, what I'm interested in. So when we talk about life history of artifacts, um, <clears throat> I realized that this was a um, fairly low um, budgeted project, but have you done any uh, residue analysis, provenience studies? Nothing or? more than uh, shining UV light to try inside to see things that are likely organic and not organic. Um, in part, these things were excavated in 1960. So uh -huh. my, my guess is that if we made some big effort to do this, it would probably not lead to much but clearly that's something that so uh using low-tech means we're, we're trying to do what we can uh but i think particularly with newly excavated things like there there are new excavations of pompeii those things that would they are actually doing that and they're they're getting some interesting results but we haven't done any of that okay and uh, um in relation to that um do you have some sense of where the pots were produced, to what extent they were circulated? Uh, oh, like that? yeah, to some extent that uh, uh, some of the, uh, let's say, we're talking about cookware specifically, mm -hmm. some of the cookware is in a fabric, which is uh, presumably um, uh, locally produced. Um, the clay source, we don't quite know. Um, it involves a, a clay that develops um, in volcanic soils. And they're everywhere, and they would have been buried by the various eruptions, and they probably were small scale. I know from ethnographic work. Um, uh, other cookwares that were clearly imported from some distance. We have, for example, uh, a nice lid that, uh, from the, the Villa Regina that was made in Tunisia. Uh, African cookware becomes quite common in, in, uh, in, in the Roman world, it distributed over large areas. We have other regional products that are probably made at Kumai, these certain nonstick pans and things like that. Um, in terms of other wares like jars and whatnot, there's a, a there's an important clay source uh, probably about 35 kilometers away, just uh, just inland from the modern city of Salerno, at a place called Oliara, which it seems to have been much favored in historically recent times, and now chemical analysis is demonstrating an antiquity as a source from it. It was a, kind of a rare source of, of uh, fine-bodied uh, 
fine-grained uh, high calcium, which is good for these types of vessels. You don't get so much of that in the area because of the volcanic landscape. And uh, it's clear that that was distributed over quite large areas. And, um, and um, I kind of got onto this because of ethnographic work and suggested it. And it turns out that I was right, apparently. Um, so I, if I'm known for small things, that's one of the things. So yeah, we can say a bit about that, uh, but not as much as we'd like. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. Um, sort of following up on the question of uh, the life of the artifacts, but what happens when you have so much pottery um, after registration, documentation, and all of that? What happens with all that pottery? Hmm. Well, in the case of the Palatine, someone spends their entire adult life uh, trying to uh, classify it and quantify it and, and get it through to publication. Um, and uh, well, different projects take different approaches to that <laughs> and dealing with that question. I must say that um, excavations of Pompeii through into the 1960s were, how shall I say, not particularly diligent in their um, retaining of pottery that they found. If something was a piece of terra sigillata or it had a stamp on it, literature and art, uh, <laughs> or it was an intact lamp that would get collected and inventory. Um, a lot of the objects were collected, but not inventory, and they were sent off to a storeroom. And so I mentioned 800 examples of one kind of form being a storeroom. Like 780 of those, we don't know where they're from, because we I mean, know they're from Pompeii, and that's about it. Um, and so I, I mentioned this when I talked about taking um, household inventories and trying to make sense out of them using Gutman scales, which is often done by ethnographers to kind of see what households on what kinds of things. And and this is heresy for a pottery specialist to say, but to me, it's like great that they didn't keep the pottery because that would take me like 20 lifetimes to include that. And it's going to be very low on the Gutman scale anyway. So it's not going to, because that's cheap throwaway stuff. And so it's not going to differentiate between households to different levels, let's say, of, of affluence. Uh, so I'm kind of not answering your question, but uh, different projects deal with their massive pottery in different ways. In the Palatine, for example, um, amphora body sherds, we did a quick sort on them, we counted them, weighed them. Um, and then they're actually dumped back into the site because we have to refill the site. Uh, and so uh, about, when I say 20 metric tons, it's not like we identified, <laughs> like we were working on maybe like five or six of them because the rest of it was stuff that, uh, that we could do a quick and dirty uh, treatment of and, and get rid of it because um, mm -hmm. there's just endless amounts of this stuff. Yeah, yeah Frank. Uh, you mentioned uh, the ongoing research projects and excavations in Pompeii. What would you say that for pottery studies specifically, uh, Pompeii has more to offer now with the modern technology we have and, and the means we have, but also with the special conditions there as compared to any other site in Italy, for instance, for the study of Roman pottery, what, what can we get more out there? Well, residue analysis, for example, you know, they're applying to the recently excavated bar and getting spectacular results about the particular foodstuffs that were being included in a stew and, and things of that sort. Um, so I would say that's, that's a, a, a big area. Um, we do get a lot of intact pottery. So if you want to do things like 3D scanning to calculate the uh, capacities of volumes of vessels, that of course is something that's not exclusive to Pompeii. It, it can be done, let's say, more extensively to site like Pompeii, I guess I'd say. Um, but considering, yeah, the special conditions of the end of this town and, and maybe also the, preserv yeah, the preservation conditions that are so special there, what, what can we get more and now then, and, and or maybe guess, in the near future? I guess looking at the context, right? Because we have, I mean, it, um, it's not that as, as Lou Binford claimed, you know, a, a neutron bomb was dropped on Pompeii, but it had this complex end game where there was a big earthquake and the town was largely abandoned and then partially repopulated. Then people saw Vesuvius going up for many, many hours and said, I'm getting out of here. And they grabbed their stuff and left. And then Vesuvius came down and all the upper floors got crashed in and everything. Then people came back later and tried to uh, salvage stuff and were digging all around. Uh, so it's actually a, a, a complex sequence of processes and events. But it is still the case that we have an amazing amount of stuff in, in use-related contexts, right? Um, and so if one's trying to think about, I'll give you an example. In, in the Villa Regina Boscoreale, they, they, 
got a lot of detailed evidence out of the kitchen about like what pottery was on what shelf and things like that. And one of the cool things I just realized is there's a, uh, an Ola sitting on the floor just next to a, a, shel a, a shelving unit. And it has a lot of um, uh, deposition of, of, uh, of calcium carbonate in the inside. It was pretty clearly being used for boiling water or something like that, right? And then on the shelf just above it, there's a lid that fits on that jar. So, I mean, it's like a small thing, but you can see that they, they, they boiled the water, they took, the, they, they took it off the, the hearth, they put it on the floor, they took the lid and they put it up on the shelf right next to it, right? That's a very small thing. But, or on that same shelf, for example, there's a glass uh, uh, ampulla, uh, unguentarium, uh, uh, what do you call it, like a, a food stuff or an ointment or a perfume or medicine container. And it tipped over in the eruption. And just a few centimeters away is one of these um, small glass discs that we usually think are gaming pieces. And they were often gaming pieces, right? And they might have been used for other reasons. But I started thinking about it, you know? There's one of these glass discs and you would need like 15 of them or really 30 of them to have a set of gaming pieces, right? Yeah, or you might have a random glass disc, but there's just this one glass vessel next to it. And we can't test the idea because one is in the museum and the other's in the antiquarium, so we can't unite them. But on paper, it looks like you could take this disc and use a mastic or something and use it to stopper the, the ampulla, right? So I'm saying that in this article is about to come. People are going to think I'm a nut, but, um, but I, I, think it's, I think it's there for some reason. Um, and so maybe these kind of contextual associations, again, are things that we do have at Pompeii, uh, where you can begin to think about, like, where do people keep things and in what quantities? So with pottery, you can do that you know, to some extent. So I'd say that. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Lots of interesting pictures there. Just focusing on this last thing, like like I think June, my mind immediately went to sewing, but I wondered if you've ever shown any of these to people who work in modern day arts and crafts of various sorts, because they got a lot of different gizmos mm -hmm. that the rest of us don't even know what they are. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I I'm think just you're curious right. if you've gone down. I, I have not done that. I, I've Googled yeah. around myself in the privacy of my own home. Um, and uh, um, I've thought a lot about it, but I, I, I suspect that I, I thought, I thought that, and maybe Jun's right. I thought when he said this, that is say, ah, finally someone is going to have, as you're saying, said, oh, that's a, a this and that, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, because I think you're right that, that um, I, the, the idea that this is a siget that is part of a horse harness, I don't exclude that that's, I mean, that, that's the, the best of a bunch of not great guesses. In it's hard view. to resist that image, um, you know, sticking yeah, yeah. fingers through it. Yeah, yeah, you this thing and you want to stick your fingers through those things, yeah. for sure, you know? And that's why for decades people said, oh, it's for an archer to draw a bow, but it, archers looked at that and said, no, nah, there's no way that would work for drawing a bow. I'm sorry, that, that wouldn't work, you know? Yeah, there um, may be no modern analog, but you never know. But the thing I'm kind of stuck on, like I said, is it, it's almost like, you know, if you look at a pair of eyeglasses, there are the two nose pieces, right? And there are these two weird deliberate elements that are on one side of it and not on the other. And so it really suggests that it needed to be seated in some way on that side, on something that was of a size where those would be seatings for it. And it makes you think of a pair of eyeglasses, I meant to say. Um, but what you could wear on your head with points sticking out you know, <laughs> beats me. Uh, I'm not claiming that, but I can't get past that. Uh, but I, 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 think, I think you're right that many of these things that are mysterious, that there's a good chance someone could look at it and say, oh, you know, Oh, yeah, I use that all the time. Here's what it is. So if people have ideas. I had this other mystery object, but not time to show it to you. So I guess we'll never know about that. Um, okay, thank you. Do we have uh, one more question? or no? Maybe I'll ask one. Yeah, one. Last one. Um, that scanner you were using on the iPad, was that, yeah. was that the in built-in iPad Pro scanner? Or were you using no, it was a separate one. It was so many years ago. I don't remember its specs, but it was like a cheapo, like $400 thing that, you could attach an iPad and mm -hmm. where are we? Well, that's what the oh. pros. Um, and this was like a, like a very low tech kind of thing. We were curious about to what extent we can um, point it inside vessels and, mm -hmm. and, and get a scan. And um, in Amphry, we could kind of, we could get the inside of the neck and the part down by the spike, but you couldn't get you know, the, the shoulder and all was in a shadow mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, but we were sort of surprised and impressed with, you know, actually the quality of the scans you could get for, and this was in like 2016, mm -hmm. uh, with a thing that cost maybe like $400 and just mm -hmm. attached to an iPad or something like that. It was a lot of fun to play with it. It does produce these ridiculously large files, which I can't download anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big problem for me right now. Yeah. Um, so well, I, I can give you the specs if you're curious, but I don't, I don't recall them. You may be interested. We just got a light on the end of a wire or a boroscope for eliminating vessels and things like that. Say that again? We just got at the ARF here, we just uh -huh. got a light on the end of a wire that's 16 feet long. So you long. can lower into, into a yeah, vessel? Yeah, you could, you could go all the way into the end for a... Yeah, I know some folks have been yeah working with that kind of camera, technology to get yeah, scanned with the interior of the vessel. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, not a scanner, but a oh, camera. Oh, but a camera. Yeah. Yeah. That'll, that'll right. come soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was sort of wondering, and this might be outside of the scope of what you're doing, but I feel like there's a lot about, um, like, the organization of the objects in the household and then, like, the eventual fate of the objects as they became damaged or made their way to the midden. Is there much in your research about, like, how new objects were coming into the household and, like, from what sources and how those were sort of organized? The next thing I'm going to work on now that I've finished this article that I started in June of 2020 during COVID, but oh, I'll be done by August, <laughs> uh, was I wanted to look specifically at the uh, assemblage of glass vessels from these houses with those sorts of issues in mind. Um, and um, I've already made some progress about like seeing services of like five identical cups and that kind of thing. And I know a bit about what we know about how glass was distributed at Pompeii or where the shops were and things like that. So yeah, I'm interested in those kinds of issues. And that's kind of what I wanted to do in this second part of this article, whether I'll get to it in my lifetime, um, we'll have to see. But so yeah, I'm really interested in that. Because I was thinking about the glass vessels specifically as you were talking to them about being like sort of like an emerging field of manufacture. Mm -hmm. And I was, do, uh, I don't have necessarily like a lot of subject knowledge here, but do we have much evidence like the manufacture of those things like in like the physical implements that would have been used like you're talking about like mm -hmm. the uptake and like ponting like you have um examples of ponty from the site or is that something that we think would have been like done at some other site and then brought in and trade we, we don't have any uh, i don't think we know about any glass workshops at pompeii we do have big chunks of raw glass from pompeii that you find these um um but we don't know where the vessels were made. Although in some cases, like with that mold blown on Wintarium, it's pretty clear that those are exotic. Um, but uh, yeah, there have been a lot of people, if, if you go to the website of the Corning Museum of Glass, uh, the CMOG, and there are these like two guys in the UK, who were their names, at Taylor and some, they have this website where they've done a, a lot of work figuring out how to um, uh, make Roman glass. And if you want to see some neat YouTube videos, including one about cracking off, uh, you can go to the, the CMOG, Corning Museum of Glass, or Google these other guys, every Taylor and someone else, Nichols, maybe Nicholson, maybe. Um, and they're really good videos about mold blowing. And, and um, But it looks like that the, the tools were, were pretty much uh, that you have a blowpipe, you have the jacks, which are these big tongs that, and this show on TV where they have people like competitively making glass, I forget what it's called right now, like, smash it or something like that it's super fun to watch because you you can see like what's involved in, in blowing glass um uh and um what's it called a uh, souffle i think a little thing yeah there the it looks like the, the the basic tools haven't probably changed very much since since about the middle of the first century ad it took them that long to figure out you know how to punty and this kind of stuff and it's pretty much been been with us since then and so that's I, that's stuff that we have mostly evidence of in like how the how the vessels are worked as opposed to like we don't find the tools, the tools but yeah. you can you can like reverse engineer them from looking at the at the, the results or some of the what I call the micromorphology on vessels. That works, but I do that a lot with pottery with glass. It's it's of course difficult to do because of the molten nature of it. But um, but yeah, I think people have a pretty good idea about how most Roman glass was was being formed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ted. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, really for attending. Yeah.
stuff. Oh yeah. If I can take a picture of it. Um, or if you want, do you have my email? Uh, you can find me, email me, and I can send you.